everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Rights for Women. I'm really excited about my guest this week, Kelly Rimmer. Uh, I absolutely adored Kelly's book, The Warsaw Orphan, as I've loved all her books. And uh, I can't wait to chat to Kelly about how she actually went about writing this fantastic book. And I also want to just check in with everybody uh, about the sound quality on this week's episode. I've had a few issues with the sound on the podcast lately, and uh, I just would love any feedback that you've got in terms of how it sounds and whether this episode actually sounds any different. So without any further ado, let's get on to chatting about Kelly. Kelly Rimmer is the New York Times Wall Street Journal, USA Today and worldwide best-selling author of contemporary and historical fiction, including The Secret Daughter and The Things We Cannot Say and Truths I Never Told You. Kelly announced that she would become an author when she was still in kindergarten, a girl who knows her own mind from a young age. For decades, she wrote for herself, always hoping to be published, but it wasn't until her mid-30s that she was ready to even show family or friends any of her stories. And then one night, she came home, pressed the publish button and put her first novel out into the world. Since then, Kelly's books have been top 10 bestsellers in Australia, have topped Kobo, Amazon and Apple Books charts and have even appeared on bestseller lists including The Go, Globe and Mail and the Toronto Star lists in Canada and the New York Times, Wall Street Journal and USA Today lists in the United States. Kelly's novels have been translated into more than 20 languages. Her latest novel, The Warsaw Orphan, has been out for a few weeks now and is getting rave reviews. Kelly lives in rural Australia with her family and a whole menagerie of badly behaved animals, including goats, uh, which I also have, <laughs> two goats. And she's recently been dealing with a mice plague, which I might ask her about in a minute. Kelly is joining me today on the Convo Couch to discuss turning fact into fiction for the In the Warsaw Orphan. And as I mentioned earlier, I found the Warsaw Orphan just the most gripping, gruelling at times, but compelling read. And I'm absolutely so excited to talk to Kelly about it today. Recording one, two, three. So Kelly, welcome to the Rights for Women Convo Couch. Hi, Pam. I'm really glad to be here. And we've got your beautiful, gorgeous rural background there. We can see and your my, trees on your property. <laughs> my blinding sun that's coming streaming through the window. It's been raining all morning, so hopefully it'll go away again in a minute. Give us some more lovely rain. Yeah, no, for sure. No, you're looking gorgeous with that glow behind you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm an <laughs> angel with the angelic yeah. glow. <laughs> well, Let's get straight into it. We're here to talk about The Warsaw Orphan and congratulations on the release. It's, it's a fabulous book. I've already sung its praises in the intro um, and there is so much I want to talk to you about, particularly in this, on this topic of turning fact into fiction. And of course, there is so much that's fact in the book, but you've done such an amazing job of fictionalising it. But for people Thank who you. might not know, could you just tell us what the story is about? Absolutely. So the story opens in Warsaw in 1942. We have young Amelia Elzbieta. Um, she's a, a girl who's living under a false identity. She's basically lost her whole biological family, but she's living with a really loving set of adoptive parents and her uncle. And because of her background, they are going to great lengths to try and keep her safe. They have her living as Elzbieta Rabinek, and she's effectively allowed only within her own apartment because they don't want her out on the streets. Poland is occupied. And so they're kind of keeping a low profile as much as they can, but they allow her one freedom. And that's this brief period each day where she's allowed to go down into the apartment blocks courtyard, just to have some fresh air and some time to herself. But Elzbieta's life has been out of control for a really long time and she starts to really subtly rebel. It's just as simple for her as visiting a neighbour instead of going to the courtyard. And through this neighbour, she discovers this whole other world that is happening just a few blocks away in the Warsaw Ghetto. And the story follows Elzbieta Amelia and a young Jewish boy she meets in the ghetto, Roman, as they navigate some really turbulent years in Warsaw through the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising and then the Warsaw Uprising and then the early years of the communist um, occupation. Yeah, Did I miss anything? Great, 
No, I think that's a great description without spoilers or anything, Kel. So well done. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you. So <laughs> I was lucky enough to get a an arc of this book and read it a little while ago. And I thought I'd go back to, and it, I have to say, like many of your books or all of your books, I think, but this one in particular, I found completely compelling. Uh, oh, and thank you. I I thought I'd go back to the message that I sent you after I read it, and this is what it was. I said, it's bloody amazing, completely mm -hmm. compelling, and so damned heartbreaking. I cannot believe the level of detail on your writing, your best yet. And I'm betting it's not just me uh, that ha I'm not the only one that's had those reactions. I've already looked up Goodreads, and I found this quote yesterday. The Warsaw Orphan will make you cry. It will make you think. It will make you appreciate your life. The strength of humanity and the power of family is amazing. This is in no way an easy book to read. It is one you need to savour to take your time with and appreciate. And there's lots of things in there I want to talk to you about, but what sort of reaction has the book been getting so far and what sort of messages and feedback have you been getting, Kel, on it? Yeah, um, I, I feel really lucky to have the readers that I have who send me um, and friends like you who send me amazing messages like that because as you know you write the book and then there's this really long period of time where it's getting ready for publication and so you're editing it but it's kind of just you and an editor and maybe your agent or just you and the editorial team um, and that long lead time is just like purgatory it could go either way it's someone once said um writing a novel is like telling a joke and then waiting a year to see if it's funny and in this case, you know, you, I wrote most of this book or a big chunk of this book or finishing it actually during lockdown last year. And it was probably in that sense, one of the more difficult periods to write in because the whole world felt so chaotic and kids were homeschooling and husband was working at home and it was all kind of bonkers. And then I'm trying to write this book, which I'm, which I, from the outset, I knew was going to be the most emotionally taxing out of all of the emotionally taxing books that I've written. And so it was, it was hard, but, I, but so far the reception has been amazing and people have been so kind and generous. And, um, you know, I think this is, this is not meant to be an easy read. I, I don't think any World War II fiction should be an easy read. My voice is meant to be conversational, but the content that I'm writing about, particularly in this book, it, it should kind of be harrowing. Anytime we pick up a historical novel that is set during this era, it should not be fun to read. And so, you know, that for some readers, that will probably be too much, um, but, it, but you have to be authentic. And so that's that's just the reality of it. Yeah, no, it's so true. But did you, so, you know, you were aware, obviously, Kelly, of the the impact, I guess, that writing about, you know, such a, a disastrous period in world history could have and in such a traumatic time for so many and for the mm. whole world, in fact. Um, but did you sort of have an inkling as you were writing it or when it was getting into its final stages of, of the potential impact on readers? Um, yes, yes. But, like, but, and it's kind of a... Con a conscious choice at times actually I'm going to read you a little excerpt from the book it's just a couple of paragraphs and it at times I was when I was doing my research I was thinking is this you know the realities of life in the Warsaw ghetto were so brutal and so cruel and as I'm writing it and I'm thinking this is hard to research and it's hard to write it's going to be hard to read but the only way to get around that would be to move the book, like to move the setting. That's the fact of it. Yeah. And so I'm going to read you just this paragraph, if that's okay. Yep, for sure. So this is this is Elsbieta Amelia, and she's talking to Sarah, who is a nurse who lives in her apartment building. And Sarah has been, or Sarah, she's S A R A. Um, she has been with a team of nurses and social workers, she's been going to the Warsaw Ghetto and trying to smuggle children out to safety or relative safety on the other side. And Amelia has become involved in that work and they're having a conversation as they leave one day. And Amelia says to Sarah, I don't know how you do this every day. I whispered shakily after a mother and father told us in no uncertain terms to leave their apartment. So Sarah has asked a family to give her their child to take away oh, and I've got goosebumps just thinking oh, about it I know yeah. the, uh, the thought of that is just gut-wrenching mm -hmm. you know families had to make this decision not knowing what the future 
within the ghetto was for them or having an inkling that it, it might actually be, they might effectively be doomed. But do you send your children with a stranger, you know, yeah. and, and how are you ever going to find them again, even if you do escape? So it's, it's this whole big impossible decision. And Sarah says to Amelia, you know, Amelia said, I don't know how you do this every day. And Sarah says, neither do I, she admitted smiling ruefully. Some days I think I have reached the end of my tolerance, but other days I know that it is not for me to decide when enough is enough. Not while these people simply cannot opt out. The thought of that helps me to carry on. And obviously writing the book is not a patch on what, what people who actually did this work went through or the people who lived in the ghetto. But every time I would think, is this going to be too much for readers? You know, it, it, the research was so hard. I think people live this, Kelly. And I, I didn't know much at all about the Warsaw Ghetto when I started researching or, or any of the events that happened in the book. I really am, am kind of embarrassed about my ignorance. And so I, I wanted to drill down and I wanted to tell the story because if some, I'm fascinated about history and I've got Polish ancestry and if I don't know anything about this, there's plenty of other people who don't. And so I, it helped me to press on to think we cannot forget we absolutely, it's hard to look at this history, but we must, we absolutely must, because we know if we don't, then it can happen again. And so, so that, that, that's the answer. I think I was conscious that it might be difficult for readers, but you can't shy away from it. Yeah. Well, I'm going to jump forward to, because uh, I want to come back to where you got the original idea for the story, Kelly, okay. and the inspiration for it. But what you've just been talking about was something that really struck me when I was reading the book. You know, I'm uh, in the past, my past life, I was a history teacher. You know, I taught the about the world wars at, um, you know, HSC level. And um, I have to say, I didn't really know anything about the Warsaw Ghetto. I mean, you hear about it. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of uh, cases, I, I guess, because the whole history of World War II and the whole terrible story of what happened to the Jewish people is so big that you know and and the Warsaw Ghetto is an important part of that but it's often mm. sort of brushed over or glossed over where you don't get time to find out about it so one thing that really struck me in reading the book was as you say how important it is for people to remember and it sort of struck me too that we're, we're now living in the next century to when all that happened and, you know, I'm thinking of my own daughters who all did history at school too, but, you know, like me, would have no idea of that and just how with each generation we're getting further and further away. So I really felt that, you know, like you, that this is such an important story and that we must remember these things. Mm. I think the sheer scale of the events of World War II, it, it would be impossible, particularly for someone who's not an academic, it, impossible for any one of us to know enough about the the breadth of it there was you know so many occupied countries and and there were there were I can't remember the exact figure but there were many 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 ghettos and so and Warsaw was the biggest it was the largest and the most populous but even so the conditions in there were replicated in other places and we can't you can't know about every single one of them but I think the particular part of this of Warsaw's history that drew me to writing about it was just the sheer relentlessness of those years. It wasn't, it wasn't that there was, you know, the, the city was just occupied, which would have been bad enough, but the city was occupied and there was this massive ghetto set up. And then there was an uprising in the ghetto that was just like it, that alone, that event alone, I want to tell everybody I know about it because mm. this group of Jewish people who had been starved and tortured for years most of them had been taken to Treblinka and, and suffocated and then cremated in the forest and just disrespectfully murdered and then their bodies not even respected. And this scrappy little group of people left behind fought for 28 days and held off the might of the Nazi army. But in this, in this there, were, there were no resources left and yet they managed to achieve the impossible. And I feel that story alone I wanted to tell that story because the, for a long, long time, the German, the Jews had, uh, sorry, the Nazis had had this message that the Jews were cowards and, you know, they were the, they were the under race. And these, these men and women were so courageous in the fate of almost certain death. They just wanted to die with dignity. And that story alone was so huge and so immense that I just, that, that I didn't know much about that 
I was thinking this is something that even in that sea of things that I wish I knew more about, even in the sea of all of these events across World War II that I, I will never understand enough, that one alone was the story that I really wanted to tell. And then, of course, the relentlessness of it, it goes on and on, the, the city uprising and the, the communists, the Soviets occupying. So, yes, I, I wish I wish there was a way that you could just, like, download all of the information so that we could all be better informed. But I, I guess mm. you, the, I think the role of historical fiction is actually so that somebody might read this book and go, I don't actually know enough about this. This is a novel. It's fictional, but I would like to educate myself now. You know, I, I didn't know about it before, but I'm going to go do some reading or listen to some oral history or watch a documentary, you know, and I think that's the power of this genre. Absolutely. And the, and the power behind having characters that you can relate to mm. as a reader and empathise with is I think it just, it does make it, you know, the fiction to me a lot more powerful than particularly yes. when it's it's written the way you've written it. But oh, thank um, you. <laughs> to then, you know, I mean, history, reading history books can be watching a doco on TV, well, you know, the world at war or whatever can be pretty dry. But mm. I really feel like, you know, bringing these stories to life in fiction and through the characters is is a really great way for readers to relate or you know try to relate in some kind of way to what happened and to learn mm. more about it so um yeah fantastic so let's go back a little bit where did you get the initial idea for this story and then starting from that sort of kernel of fact I guess how did you then go about developing it and you know like you were saying Kelly like it is such a big story also how did you go about narrowing it down mm. well funnily enough so originally I wanted, Amelia appears in my earlier novel, The Things We Cannot Say, mm. and she's got this minor role, but she, to me, she always felt like a special character. I wanted her to have a broader role. And when I first started planning that book, I, I because, because I went to Poland to research that book and I was in amazing museums and libraries and talking to different people and the story of Irena Sendler, who was a real-life Polish hero, heroine, kept coming up and I became quite fascinated by Raina. She led this team of mostly women and they, just like Sarah in my book, went into the Warsaw Ghetto and saved and then sustained the lives of more than 2,500 Jewish children. So they smuggled them out, found them families, taught them Catholic prayers so they could hide in plain sight. Sometimes Jewish boys, they would um, have them dress and, and pretend to be girls so that they wouldn't arouse suspicion if, you know, obviously Jewish boys are generally circumcised and the Nazis certainly did not think twice about checking that on, even on children. And so they went to these extraordinary lengths to rescue and then say, keep up safe these children and that story just kept sticking with me and so I had envisioned that Amelia might go to Warsaw and somehow somehow get involved in that so that I could tell part of that story but you know you know what it's like when you're writing a book you can only fit so much in it and that was already a huge story um, and as I started trying to really get nut out the plot it quickly became apparent that the book was going to be 10,000 pages long and I would have to cut out some of that. Um, and so I kind of set that aside, had Amelia remain a child in that story. And at the end of that book, spoiler alert, <laughs> she leaves the village that she lives in. And so you know that, you know, she survives because she appears in the modern day timeline as well as an elderly woman, but there's a gap you know, she, she survives in the historical timeline and she appears in the contemporary timeline. And I had that kind of fleshed out in my mind, but couldn't fit it in. And so I set that aside and went off and wrote another book. But while I was publicising the things we cannot say, I went to a book club and it was here near, near I live in Orange. And it was a, one of my old colleagues from my one, a previous job, his wife had invited me to come and talk to her book club that's been meeting for a couple of decades and they were amazing women and it was the best afternoon. But as I walked in, we were all kind of swapping family stories because so much of the things we cannot say is about our family histories and, you know, connecting with those while our grandparents or our parents are alive when we can. And a woman was telling me that her grandmother knew of someone who was smuggled out of a ghetto in Hungary in a suitcase. And like this little flare went up like, oh, that that's like a rainy settler and I wanted to write that story and I was I'll ponder that later had lovely lunch and at the end of the lunch we were, they were asking me questions and one of the questions was will you write a sequel to the things we cannot say which by then I had answered a couple of hundred times <laughs> so the answer was 
I can't. <laughs> All of the loose ends are tied up. And the same woman said to me, but Kelly, what happened to Amelia? Can't you just write Amelia's story? And that was the big light bulb moment because oh, I already, wow. I really had it there. It was just ready to write. And so as I drove home, I actually pretty much had the, the plot kind of ding, 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 ding. You know, so you race home and you quickly take the notes. Um, and then because I didn't know all that, I didn't know Nelly enough about the events that would happen in the book just loosely that the story would, you know, flow through these historical events. Um, so that kicked off this whole process of research and away I went. <laughs> Fantastic. So then, so the next step for you, I guess, then would have been diving into that research. And then do you find then that as you're doing the research and, and you're reading the factual information that that's then sparking more and more ideas for you in terms of the story and then you're sort of Absolutely. going backwards and forwards? Yes. So originally Roman was just um, like a, simply a Jewish boy. Um, and as I was reading, I came across this, this amazing, there were three Catholic parishes that operated within the Warsaw Ghetto and plenty of Jewish Catholics who lived and were trapped in there who, for various you know reasons of family heritage, or maybe they had converted, but to the Nazis, they were still considered Jewish. Um, so there was this, this thriving kind of subpopulation of people who had some connection to the Catholic Church too. And it felt natural to write Roman as someone who's, in his case, his father was a devout Catholic and his mother Jewish. And so he is culturally considered Jewish and, but for him personally, he considers himself a mix of both worlds. And I wanted to write about identity in that, in that way that, you know, that things are not always so simple as you're one thing or another. You can be lots of different things at once. And so that took me down a little tangent and, you know, things like that, as you're reading, you kind of like, oh, we'll describe something. And then that sent you down another rabbit hole. And that might tweak bits of the plot because I do plot. I generally do a bit of like pre-research so that I can get my plot settled before I start writing. And then as I'm writing, it's, you know, oh, what about this? And then there's a new sub theme that pops up. Yeah. And are you, I know that you, with your past books, Kelly, you're a big outliner, but you do tend to Absolutely. do quite a detailed outline before yeah. you start writing. It, was it the same with this book? Yeah, I think it was 15 pages. <laughs> My poor editor. Um, <laughs> and I don't think I varied from it in this case. Sometimes I do. The book that I'm writing now, which is probably going to be called The German Wife, it, I've made a slight deviation. Um, again, because research kind of made me realise that something I had found in pre-research probably wasn't quite right, so I've adjusted it. But generally I follow the outline. The outline goes into Scrivener and then I just expand it you know I know I know this has got to happen in this scene and so that one sentence in the outline becomes you know however many words of actual text um and so that process works for me I know it really it's to some people it sounds nightmarish but it, that this seems to be how my brain works no if you if you know what your process is and it works just mm. <laughs> keep at it <laughs> yes <laughs> So can we talk a little bit about Elspieta and Roman? As So they, yeah. they were based, I guess, like all of the story in, in these real people. Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell us about their characters and, and how do you go about developing your characters? Do they develop as you're writing? Do you do separate little character descriptions? How does that work for you? Yeah, I, I don't really, it's one of those mysterious aspects to it. I don't do a lot of intentional planning. Uh, you know, you have those writing days where writing actually means walking the dogs and thinking about the story. I think the characters evolve in my mind during those really informal brainstorming sessions. It's not, sometimes it's not even that separate. Sometimes I'm washing the dishes or, or folding the laundry or something and I'm thinking about what would it be like for a 13-year-old girl under these conditions? How would a 15-year-old boy, 16-year-old boy react to event X? And so the characters start to take on their own personality some woman an editor once said to me you should be able to uh answer if someone was interviewing you as a character you should know the answer to basically any question they should be vivid enough in your mind that you should know how they would react and I don't but I don't write like a character study or do a questionnaire but I have an idea about it, it happens organically when it's working sometimes that you know you have to force it sometimes you, you know how it is but um and by that I mean sometimes I'll reach a point in the when I'm actually writing where I, oh, I don't know, how is she going to react to this? Or I'll, a lot of writing, I think my first drafts are so rough 
and so inelegant and they are jarring like I don't have scene transitions sometimes or if if the point of the scene is to get to point x in the plot sometimes I do it too too abruptly and I have to go in and soften it or I'll have something really dramatic happen and when I'm refining later I realize actually you've got to smooth that out a little bit or it's going to be too shocking for the reader not that it can't be shocking but you have to do it in certain ways so that the reader's not pulled out of the story and so sometimes when I'm thinking about the characters and how they react I have to you know pull all that together in a way that feels organic um and Elspieta she's she's meant she's intended to read as this curious headstrong determined girl she is she starts a book as someone who's lost almost everything and she but she still has compassion for other people and for Roman as well he's he's probably the most broken angry of all of the characters I've ever written I don't think I've, I've never really written anger in this way before but he's driven by outrage and so he should be his his mm. family and his entire world has been turned into this torturous existence for no reason it's it's not they've done nothing wrong their crime was being born and and so he's got this righteous anger that drives him and I found that really difficult to write um but it, again it's kind of you kind of meditate on it you marinate mm. in it a little bit and you just think about and I think the research helped with that particularly with Roman because I was looking at a lot of photos and listening to oral histories and reading them I've read these great memoirs and I'm thinking my god how could this happen you know and it, it does it does make you angry it's it's not just and it's not right and it's not fair and so that, I think that helps to drive the way that the character reads it should help to drive the way that the character reads on the page mm. yeah so you're drawing on your own anger at the situation and about what you're reading yeah, yeah. and of course that's a taste it's yeah reading reading these secondhand accounts is not a patch on what these people actually went through but when you're trying to represent it you can only draw I guess on that so do you spend a fair bit of time Kelly in uh immersing yourself in that material you know you mentioned the oral histories the memoirs I don't know if you watch anything any sort of video thing or talk to people who've you know I mean a bit hard in this situation but maybe with mm -hmm. your other books talking to people who have, have yep. experienced different things mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's the, the best. The, the three forms of research I like the best are photographs because you can see that there's this one particular picture of a boy being evacuated, evacuated, being removed from the ghetto to, to be taken probably to Treblinka. He's this little Jewish boy with his little hat and he's being held at gunpoint. And the look on his face, you know, you're looking at context clues like the, the clothing and the buildings, but the emotion in the face of these people, you know, that, so you draw on that, I draw on that. Um, so it's photos, oral histories, uh, hearing people talk about their experiences. And when I'm writing contemporary stories and I can ring people or meet with people, I love to do that, to have a conversation and to, particularly if you can get in a room with someone or on a Zoom with someone and you can mm. see their reactions and um, you, that's because uh, you're drawing on people's experiences and you're trying to represent them on the page and it's such a an intangible process but there is something magic about real life accounts as you say history textbooks can be so dry reference books can just be cold and clinical because that, that's kind of academia isn't it but but people's real life accounts are magic for for this kind of fiction I find mm. Yeah, no, great, great tip there for people writing anything, really. I think it doesn't mm. even have to be historical, does it? Mm. No, that's true. And people generally want to help. I remember on my last book, there was a um, postnatal depression. I wrote about postnatal depression and I was, I'd written a draft and it just was not, there wasn't an emotional depth to it and I was really unhappy with it. And I put a call out on my personal Facebook page for people. Does anyone know anyone who might want to talk to me about this? And I actually had more, just from my personal Facebook, Facebook page, which is not, I don't have a lot of friends, Pam. <laughs> like <laughs> in real life I do, but Facebook not so much. Um, and I had more offers for interviews than I could possibly have done. So people want to help. And I think when you're first starting out, it, it, I remember with my earlier books, no way would, it was so hard when I needed to approach people for research help. But as time's gone on, I realized people really love helping you get it right. 
they're, and they're excited. Often, like with postnatal depression, people were saying to me, "Oh, I'm so excited that you're writing about this because I didn't know about it until it happened to me." So they want to help you. So yes, that is. If you're an aspiring writer, don't hesitate to ask people because they often want to tell you their story, and that will help you more than you know. Yeah, I recently spoke to someone who had a similar experience to the book I'm writing now, and mm. it's just hearing a different version of the story just sparks so much in your your mind about different options for your plot you know and your characters yes Mm. absolutely and so with the Warsaw orphan Kel you know we've talked about obviously the dark subject matter um, but there's so much that's beautiful in the story as well and you know uh, obviously the compassion that the characters have for each other and and the strength and determination that that they find uh, how did you go about sort of balancing the light and the dark I guess as you were, mm. were plotting and I guess particularly as you get onto those later drafts yeah I, my first ever publisher said to me if you want to write about dark you need to know a lot about light and every single book because I always am drawn to these crazy dark topics <laughs> me too um, <laughs> what is it about us why Pam? <laughs> How can we stop doing this to ourselves and our readers? Um, uh, Every single book, there's a point, particularly towards the end, where I'll go back and look and see you have to balance. It's not about, I like I said, I wanted the book, I wanted this book to be harrowing because the subject matter should be harrowing. But if you're going to put your readers through that, you have to remind them that there's humanity in every each of these awful moments, some kind of humanity shines through. And in this book, those family connections and the connection between friends and people, people being selfless and kind, it, that, that happened. That happens every time. Every time we as a species are in crisis, there is goodness somewhere to be found. And so... The, the one point where I had to go back and really adjust it was there's this point where um, it, where Roman and Amelia are in this kind of bubble for a brief period of time where Roman's recovering from an injury and I realised that I was about to take these characters from one really intense scenario into another in the very next chapter and so I wrote an extra scene where they're just connecting and they're just two kids and it's awkward because they're two kids and they've started to get feelings for each other but they're, you know, they're, they're in this weird situation and they don't know how to proceed and and you know so I just kind of tried to take them out of all of the chaos for a minute and then before I drop them back in it in the next chapter but so that the reader could have a break and they could have a break and I could have a break (laughs) and we could all just (laughs) you know you have to you have to balance it and so if you're going to write great scenes of emotional depth and heartbreak and tragedy you have to be able to write some love or hope or peace or something at some other point in the book for the most part yeah and like you say for you for you two while you're writing it were you Mm. were there times and I'm sure there must have been where you were so deeply immersed in it that you just thought oh I just can't do this and and what do you do when you get to that point you know do you have any sort of little self-care routines that you go through um, sometimes I'm like quite a rational person. I'm not, not super spiritual or, you know, I don't have any superstitions or anything like that. But every now and again, when I'm writing about something like this, I like to just light a candle, take a moment and just re- reflect on the fact that you were writing about events that touched and changed and ended people, real people's lives. And you have to do it respectfully. And I think for me, because I've, I've, I've so drawn to this, era and so drawn to these characters and these scenarios but I I just I think the thing would be if I don't feel you have to do it respectfully I just keep coming back to that Mm. you have to take it seriously and that is almost like a it's almost meditative there were times when I would just say okay that's enough 30 rock for a couple of hours (laughs) absorb some comedy (laughs) um (laughs) <laughs> go for nice walks <laughs> with the dog um I think this was probably the hardest research I've ever done the, the book I'm writing now is probably equally as difficult and it's just a case of trusting your your instincts and when you feel like you're a bit wrung out it's like I say to my kids when you start to feel frustrated with something you need to step back from it for a minute and then try again later and it's a bit of the same when I start to feel overwhelmed by the subject matter you just step back from it for a minute and then you come back to it later with fresh eyes but it should be upsetting this is I I know I'm rabbiting on about this but I really feel like 
if I, if you're writing about level two and you're not disturbed by it, you're not digging deep enough because nothing, this is such an intense and disgusting part of human history. It, sh it should not be easy to look it in the eye. No, for sure, for sure. And Kel, one of the things, you know, that we've, we've sort of touched on this, uh, you talked about the research, but the level of detail in your writing in capturing um, you know, the setting and, and those mm. moments and the, the different events that happen throughout the story is, is actually quite amazing. Um, Thank you. When you're writing, so you're obviously absorbing all that research, you're, you're writing and rewriting. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, when you've got, say, a scene that you're writing and, you know, you really want to infuse it with a lot of detail, does that just sort of come out naturally for you once you've done that research? How much honing mm. and revision goes into that level of detail for you I've just started this new part of my process where when I'm coming to a scene I, I do it's rough it's so rough I'd be embarrassed to show you but I'm trying to write down because you know you try and try and for me I try and picture what I'm going to write and I try I know I know your <laughs> process is different <laughs> and it works for you but for me I have to stop and be able to say this is going to happen this is going to happen I can see the, the setting and so I'll try and scribble down words like and try and connect the research into that rough mind map of how the scene might what are there for example there's a scene in the new book where there's this peacock blue wall and so I'm trying to reference the wall and this missing artwork that's been sold because the family's in financial crisis and the character's eyes drawn to the, you know, the, the spot on the wall that's a different colour. And so that's a constant reminder for her of all that she's lost. And so I keep, when I'm writing, I'm glancing at the mind map and thinking, at the end of that scene, I want the reader to have a really vivid picture, except for some readers, but for most readers, they have a, I want them to have a really vivid picture of this spot on the wall and how, how like it's a instant, like constant slap in the face to the character. And I want it to feel a bit like that to the reader. And so that, and that comes out of a piece of research that I was reading about. And so I've, you draw some detail from your research and then it, you find where it fits into the scene and so I might scribble down you know um uh, something about the food that, that the family the, the turnip peels or something that the character in the, the Warsaw Ghetto is eating you know and so you're trying to draw I've, I've read that in a memoir I've heard someone talk about it in a oral history or I've seen a photo and now I'm trying to draw just that sensory stuff into the scene to make it vivid and but if that is another case where balance is critical because if you're most writers I find we love our research and we'll research all day and night <laughs> um, great procrastination and, tool oh it's so good <laughs> but when you're at the coal face you're not actually writing a history textbook <laughs> and there is such a thing as too much <laughs> and so that's and my book's always by the time we get to my editors had a look at it, my agents had a look at it, I'm always getting, I think they've just got a template. Hi, Kelly, this is too long. <laughs> we need to cut it down to 115,000 words. Every book, it's the same story. I know, I know, I should just refine the first drafts. And often that's, do we really need three paragraphs about the Peacock Blue War, Kelly? Maybe we could just have one. <laughs> um, and so it's that, I think, if where I get it right, it's a team effort because, you know what, it's, you're, you're in the forest and your editor and other people outside in the team can see the trees and they can help you figure out which, you know, how to navigate your way through it in a way that's going to be the, you, the, worst, <laughs> the worst thing would be if the reader's going, oh, you know, still on about the turnip peels. God, get it. You know, you've got to keep progressing the story. Um, and so that's another balancing. And I think actually, so teamwork and instinct. So having read lots of books, you know when you're bogging down in a story and where you're thinking, oh, come on, writer, <laughs> move on from this. Um, and so I think that's the two things for aspiring writers. Get good editorial feedback and um, read lots so you can hone your gut feel. Yeah. And, and it, of course, experience, isn't it? And, you know, mm. learning to mm. trust those instincts like you've mentioned. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. 
And I will just say for anybody that may have been wondering what those references were Kelly was making, we've had this conversation before. I don't <laughs> actually get mental pictures in my head, which is really annoying. I sort of get a feeling and a sense about things, uh, but I don't get the movie running in my head when I write or when I read. So sadly for me. And I find that utterly fascinating because you still write great books. <laughs> and I just, I think it's so amazing how all of these different processes work. So you who don't, you don't see the movie in your head, but you can make the movie in my head. I just find that absolutely brilliant. Oh, that's so that's why we're both Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so We've talked loads about the, the detail and the research and all that sort of thing, Kelly. I did have a question from um, a fellow writer, actually, on the Rights for Women community page. Uh, she would love to know, I think it was Leanne, she said she'd love to know about you writing across genres, you know, that you've written romance books. Um, and do you still enjoy writing the romance books? Which genres do you prefer? And uh, do you find that readers follow you from genre to genre? That is a very good question. Hi, mm. Leanne. Um, I just like writing. <laughs> I actually have a couple of other genres I'd like to write in at some point. And I think, so for, So it's a different part of my brain when I switch into, you know, contemporary romance mode where instead of anything could have happened by the end of this book, you know what I mean? Like it, it won't necessarily be a happy ending for everybody. Um, um, and I'm writing the history is dictating the course that the plot takes. But in contemporary romance, there's going to be a happy ending and I get to pick what it is. Like it feels like a different process and it's it's definitely less taxing. It's, mm. it's hard. Don't let anyone tell you romance is not hard to write because it is very, very hard. Um, but it's different. It's a different kind of difficult. And so for me, writing, a, writing something else is actually quite refreshing. Mm. particularly when I'm, I haven't had time when I'm writing these really in-depth historical novels. The research is so much more time intensive, um, but I would like to write romance again in the future, somewhere down the track. Uh, I also really, really, there's a couple of speculative fiction ideas that I have at some point mm. I'd like to write. So there's, the, you know, I, I just like writing. <laughs> yeah. But at the moment I'm, I'm definitely drawn to, I, and I think no matter what I write, I tried to write a romance series that was going to be lighthearted, kind of fun a little bit funny and not at all intense and I managed to write three books that each had issues at their heart there was infertility in one one of the characters has autism spectrum disorder and in the third book there was this whole backstory that was very intense I think my brain is just drawn to, <laughs> drawn to that so even when I'm trying to write fun things some of it pops out <laughs> um, and I think a lot of readers have followed me between the genres so um, because I'm amazed by people who say I've read your whole backlist and then they you know they'll they'll send me feedback on or lovely comments on books of both both kind of varieties oh that's brilliant it's great that people are reading well I'll, we love to read across genres so why yep, not exactly you know the general public out there do you ever get any resistance from from your publishers and editors about you know oh no you don't really want to write another romance novel are they happy for you to cross genres um they've, they've been happy for me to cross genres I think probably I do get resistance but it's not from anyone in the publishing realm I think people do not take romance very seriously and so when I when I said I was going to publish some romance novels as well the feedback I got from particularly Australian people kind of at the periphery of the industry or you know outside of the industry the feedback was but why <laughs> but you write good books you know which I I love it when people do that because then I give them a big long lecture about the importance of the romance genre and how big it is and how like <laughs> how it props up publishers sometimes and how it brings joy and feminism and all of these good things to a whole group of readers male and female and everywhere on that spectrum um because I get quite ranty actually when people it, people don't do that about crime which is also a genre with kind of a formulaic pattern people mm. don't do that about sci-fi or fantasy and yet the romance is is bigger than all of those genres combined and yet people think they can be kind of scornful about it so it does get me a bit ranty um but how, but people within the industry I think understand the importance of it and how loved it is and how readers are passionate about it so but it's just it's just dudes outside of the industry Pam <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> there's plenty of them <laughs> um but oh, you have to pick back on it 
It's yeah, really no, important. good on you for getting ranty. There's nothing wrong with a good rant. <laughs> <gasps> well, what is there? You've mentioned a couple of times about the book you're writing now. Is, is it possible to have a little hint about what that's about? Sure. Yep, sure. Um, it's the story of two women, two really headstrong women, one who is living in um, kind of early Nazi Germany through the war and one who is in the US through the Great Depression. and they end up in the same place at, in the second half of the book, which is Huntsville, Alabama, around the space program, around the rocket program. Um, and it's it's um, it's another historical novel, entirely historical, but I think it's um, <laughs> the research on this book is so intense. Um, and I, I, you know, I'm still writing, so it's not finished yet. But I think I think readers who enjoy it also often will like it. Or at right. least we'll, in, we'll read it. We'll like find it satisfying. Again, it's not a super fun book. I've drawn, I'm writing about another, you know, the, the Great Depression and <laughs> Germany is in the lead up to the war. Like these are not fun topics, but but they're really interesting. Mm. But I don't think your readers would expect you to write, you know, anything too lighthearted either, Kelly. Like you were saying with your romance, no, a little bit of a creep in. But you know, even yeah. your contemporaries, you you deal with very serious issues and. Um, that's what people are drawn to. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have given us some great <laughs> tips for aspiring and, and any writers out there, really. And you are going to be, I think, my Patreon victim for four curly questions. <laughs> um, so if anybody wants to hear, and there's going to be some interesting questions about writing and the writing life there. So if anybody wants to hear about that, they can uh, hop on to the website and find out more about the Patreon membership. Uh, but yeah, for now, I think all I can say is thank you so much for everything that you've you've shared with us about your writing process I for the Warsaw her. Orphan. And um, I'm just hope you know I know it's just going to be a huge success. Oh, thank you, Pam. Thanks. Thanks good for luck talking with me. The new one. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>